And so what we see is that the macro sort of secular shift is these Web3 systems with Ethereum at the forefront of that are becoming ever more programmable and therefore ever more expressive. Hey everybody, Tanner here with Wagner Ventures. On today's episode, we have Matt Cutler, co-founder and CEO at Block Native. For anyone who's new, this is the Wagner Ventures podcast, where we do snapshots with interesting founders from across Web3. Check out wagmeventures.io to learn more about the syndicate behind the podcast. But for now, let's get into it with Matt from Block Native. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm here today with Matt Cutler, co-founder and CEO at Block Native. Matt, how's it going today? It's great. Thanks for having me on, Tanner. It's a beautiful day here in sunny Northern California. Perfect. Yeah, I'm really pumped to chat today. So here just to start, could you tell us a little bit about what you were up to prior to launching Block Native and just give us an introduction of of your story a little bit? Sure. So believe it or not, depending on how you count, I've founded seven or eight different companies in different industries, different domains, different outcomes. My very first startup was an internet infrastructure company way back in 1994, while I was still an undergrad at MIT, long before it was fashionable to do internet startups, long before it was fashionable to do them as an undergrad. That one was called NetGenesis. It was the first ever web analytics business. And I like to say it was a nine-year overnight success, zero to IPO. And at the time we went public in 2000, was one of the top 35 IPOs of history, which is crazy to think about. My most recent startup was a mobile collaboration platform called Collaborate.com, basically founded on the crazy idea that people would do real work on their phones, which when we started it in 2011 was kind of heresy. Uh, That startup wound up getting acquired fairly early by Cisco. And in terms of that deal where me and my whole team had to move from the Boston area to the Bay Area, that's why I live out here now. And I was an exec in Cisco's collaboration business for about four plus years after that. And once I started to tune into the world of Web3, maybe 2016, 2017, I realized I'd kind of seen this movie before. It felt a lot like the formative stages of the internet. And so I wound up leaving Cisco to found what would later become Block Native. Love it. Interesting story. So let's talk about Block Native. Could you tell us in your words a little bit what Block Native has built thus far and what it's building towards? So we've been building for five plus years now, and we are you know, sort of core experts in the pre-chain layer, also known as the mempool. Everything that happens to a transaction between the time that it's just an idea in someone's head or in a bot's mind and it getting on chain. So it turns out that the on-chain data set is relatively straightforward and and sort of quote unquote easy to work with, where the pre-chain data set is, is a much more complex, real-time, diverse, and, and messy data space. And so we built infrastructure that captures, normalizes, and enriches this data and just makes it as easy to work with as any other part of Web3. When we first started this, it seemed sort of like a strange thing to focus on because it felt a little esoteric. Now it's very much front and center, particularly with all the focus on MEV and this new major facet of Ethereum at the merge called PBS or Proposer Builder Separation. So today we use our global infrastructure to build blocks and relay blocks on behalf of the Ethereum ecosystem. And at any given time, we're anywhere from a few percentage points to over 10% of all Ethereum blocks are flowing through block native infrastructure. Either we build and order those, so literally determining which transactions get in and in what order, and or we relay them to the validators. We're a relatively low level provider. We're one of just a handful who do what we do. And we're lucky to work with uh, many of the top projects in the space, some of the largest dApps, protocols, wallets, providers across the the ecosystem are block native customers of one flavor or another. So it's pretty fun, but also pretty challenging to be in our position. Yeah, that's fascinating. So as you mentioned, it's been since 2018. And MEV has become obviously, as you mentioned, too, it's it's a much bigger topic these days. And you were recently on the Bell Curve podcast discussing an Ethereum validator that went rogue and front ran MEV bots for, I think, 25 million bucks. Can you talk a little bit before we jump you know, more in depth on the Block Native story? You know, what was the story there and why are instances like that relevant to what Block Native is creating? Oh, that's an interesting one. So there was recently an exploit that was the first example of a malicious validator post-merge. So 
first time any t- this class of exploit had been attempted and it was quite successful. Basically, what this rogue validator or set of validators did was use the MEV Boost network to get access to the contents of a pre-built block that came through a block builder, but not then go ahead and propagate that to the network. Instead, they exploited a weakness in, in the relays where certain parts of the signature were of the, the block header signature weren't for, fully validated. And, and what this had the net effect of doing is allowing this rogue validator to get access to sandwich attacks, which are basically specially created MEV searcher bundles, and unbundle them, basically pull them apart. The big characteristic of MEV searcher bundles is they're, they're designed to be atomic, meaning these three transactions are going to be included in exactly this order, or they're not included at all. And the reason for that is the first transaction opens up a position and the, the third transaction, the final transaction closes that. But in between, there's a lot of exposure. And so the, the nature of the MEV boost infrastructure that, that powers PBS is there are trust assumptions throughout the, the stack that searchers assume that their bundles are atomic and will be private up until the moment of inclusion. Well, due to this exploit, this validation failure, the rogue validator was able to unbundle these searcher transactions and then drain a few searcher bots for a whole bunch of value. I think it was about $25 million. This created all sorts of alarm bells because basically it challenged a bunch of assumptions that a lot of actors in the ecosystem are making about how things work. Uh, But also the MEV boost relay providers, of which Block Native is one, basically became aware of this issue quite quickly, and we deployed sort of fixes and patches to address it. It's interesting that there are, as we get into this, you realize just how adversarial these public blockchain networks can be, and just how important it is to quadruple check everything because one small uh, weakness can lead to some pretty significant consequences. In the end, though, this rogue validator was slashed. That's part of the the behavior of the consensus layer. But they wound up losing, I think, on the order of you know something like thirty two thousand dollars or sixty four thousand dollars in aggregate, which certainly did not make up for the gain of twenty five million. And so, yeah, we operate at the pointy end of the stick, as it were. And these operators need to be on their game 24 hours a day, seven days a week in order to make sure that everything operates smoothly. Yeah, that's a terrific explanation. That's really, really, really interesting and cool to hear kind of what you guys have been up to in light of this situation. So back to Block Native. Can you tell us a little bit more since it's, you know, you guys got started in 2018 that the space has obviously changed a lot, both in kind of the cultural elements of it, just kind of bigger conversation about what's happening in the space. And then also technically a lot's been done since then. And so I'm, I'm curious, you know, from Block Native's perspective, how have your products evolved over this time period and kind of adapted to the market si- cycles as they've come? Yeah, that's a great question. So we started out, believe it or not, building NFT focused crypto collectible games. So this was the very beginning. This is what we were doing. This is in the immediate aftermath of CryptoKitties. And I had come from Cisco. While I was at Cisco, I had organized the global design community there. And I was a big proponent of user research and user testing. So we're building, the small team is building this NFT collectible game. And we do our first user tests. And they are literally the worst user tests I've ever seen in my career. They're like <laughs> off the scale negative. Okay. And I'm horrified by this. I'm relatively new to the ecosystem. And the development team at the time said, oh, no, 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 that's not us. Like what everyone's complaining about has nothing to do with our game. That's just crypto, right? That's just Ethereum. Like people don't know what a MetaMask wallet is. They don't know how to use it. They don't know how to fund it. And I said, guys, this is not, we're trying to build something sort of mainstream here. If people can't use it, then, you know, we're not going to succeed as an entity. And the team kind of shrugged its shoulders at the time. And in frustration, I asked, well, is there something we could build that would facilitate this? And the development team was a little surprised by that. And they said, yeah, we could probably build some little thing that helps a user get a wallet, you know, figures out if they have one or not, helps them get it, you know, set up and and funded. And then one of the big pieces of feedback that we got was is really opaque what was happening when you were transacting. And so we had this other little widget that would basically watch transactions and tell you what was happening with them. So we built these. It was real quick, a couple of weeks, I think it took. And we deployed those. And I thought they made things a lot easier to use. And we tested that. And 
you know what? The user testing was much better. It was much easier for people to get on boarded, much easier to tell what was going on. I said, great, you know, we solved that. We then started to build some context within the ecosystem. And as we started to share with them what we had built, I think it was six out of six meetings went the same way, which is this NFT game thing you have, eh, whatever. But that little widget that helps people get wallet, that's super cool. Could you build one of those for me? Could I have that? And that thing that that shows you, you know, transaction status, that's super useful too. Could I have one of those? And and it was at that moment, you know, pretty early in our life that I realized, oh, we had set out to do one thing, but maybe we had uncovered something else, that there was this real need for these developer tools that were focused on improving usability for end users, basically pulling together various aspects of the ecosystem so that users had a better understanding of what was going on. Believe it or not, five years later, we still offer what is widely perceived as one of the best wallet onboarding solutions. It's called Web3 Onboard. You can see this widely throughout the ecosystem, including it when you, when you go to Curve and you click connect your wallet, that's a block native library called Web3 Onboard that gets you there. Same thing anytime you use a Gnosis Safe, for instance, and many, many popular mainstream dApps all use Web3 Onboard to get users connected to the underlying dApp and help them get a new wallet if they need one. And so that through line has been consistent, meaning we started building that stuff and we're still offering it, but we've been generalizing it throughout the way. So most of our experiences, we build the stuff, we release it, we get feedback, we hear what people like, we hear what people need next, and we build that too. So we then built a general purpose mempool API that basically anyone can subscribe to. This is fully documented and available on our website so that you don't need to stand up your own infrastructure. You don't need to worry about all the, the vast intricacies. You can very easily use the, the block native mempool API and power your, your DAP or your protocol with that. Well, that was really abstract. People really couldn't wrap their mind around it and how to use it. So we built a front end tool to that called Mempool Explorer, which was designed just to help people understand what the API could do. And now it's the industry's only Mempool Explorer, literally an, an interface you can get to on our website where you can create Mempool data subscriptions. Click, click, click. It's all you know quite easy to use. And then you can monitor the Mempool for specific events. And that's not just by address or transaction hash, but also you know advanced you know filtering and boolean. So I want to see you know transactions to Uniswap v3 involving a specific liquidity pool above a certain value with certain conditionals put on it. Right, proof very easy to put together there. And so our story has been a story of continuous build, continuous ship, and listening very closely to what the market needs. Now we've evolved into a block builder. We're one of the leading block builders and one of the leading relay providers. And effectively, and I'll, I'll end on this, we provide sort of end-to-end -end control over the transaction lifecycle. So for entities that need very precise understanding and awareness of their transactions at every phase, we provide the only unified API to do so. It's worth noting, another thing we're well known for is we provide by far the most accurate gas estimator in the ecosystem. We have advanced advanced ML models that predict quite accurately how you need to price your transaction for next block inclusion. In fact, we do it five blocks into the future. And almost every major wallet in the ecosystem depends on that gas estimator to, to display transaction fees for priority fees in particular to their users. So you're, if you're a user of Web3, you're almost certainly a user of, of one or more of our, our pieces of infrastructure. And if you're curious about gas fees, you can see that on our website. You can also download our gas estimator browser plug plugin, which is available for Chrome, Brave, and Firefox. And you, it'll even push you alerts to let you know when gas fees are above or below certain thresholds that you specify so you can be aware of what's going on and, and act accordingly. So we're pretty ecosystem aligned. Or we try to be very ecosystem aligned and we're very focused on providing capabilities that provide real infrastructure to you know the entire stack, whether you're an end user, you're a dApp developer, you're a protocol, you're a wallet, you're a trader, all are, are very real customer segments for us. Love it. That's a remarkable journey. So zooming out about the space, you know, I'm curious, you had put together a, a Twitter thread recently on ERC 4337 and how it adds, quote, new intent layer on top of existing transaction flow. Could you explain what you mean and some of the unlocks that ERC 4337 could bring to the Ethereum ecosystem in particular? Sure. So 4337 is the first step on the journey to account abstraction. The basic idea is to make it massively easier and simpler for users to get and engage with wallets. So the basic idea is today, wallets are EOAs, externally owned accounts. They have private keys. And that 
forces a bunch of new you know, user metaphors and a bunch of complexity on the user to manage those private keys themselves. ERC-4337 and account abstraction basically makes wallets and transactions programmable so that you can get a lot more expressivity and programmability out of them, and you can massively improve user experience. Now, this is critical if we're going to onboard the next billion users, we need to make it much easier to, to use with much less sort of new ideas. ERC-4337 is a pretty interesting one. It's an ERC, not an EIP. So it's basically ERC stands for Ethereum Request for Comment versus an EIP, which is an Ethereum Improvement Proposal. And, and it's an ERC because it gets tacked on top of the existing stack. It doesn't require changes to the underlying stack and therefore a hard fork. And so it introduces all this new capability. It fundamentally changes the way users can interact with the chain, but it doesn't change the chain itself. And, and I was uh, very confused by this. Like, how are those two things possible? And as I started to try to you know, tune in to 4337. And, and I, I believe it's a really important development for the future of the, the ecosystem. I had all these questions and I started to ask people smarter than me. And I'm very lucky to, to be engaged with many people who are, who are much more experienced and smarter than me and said, hey, can, can you explain this to me? Because I can't really wrap my mind around it. And what I found was they were all having the same problem, right? They couldn't <laughs> really wrap their mind around it either. And I went, wow, that's really strange. It, no one seems to be able to, to put forward this great mental model and, and be able to explain this distinction between, you know, why 4337 is an ERC and not an EIP. So I did a bit of a deep dive. And what I came to realize is everything involved in 4337 happens upstream. It's like a, it's a layer on top of the existing stack. And, and it fundamentally, it uses this new construct called the bundler to basically act as a proxy EOA meaning you still have something that looks a lot like a regular wallet that signs a transaction and submits it to the network. But instead of the user doing that, there's this new piece of infrastructure called the bundler that does this on behalf of the user. As fate would have it, ERC-4337 bundlers look a lot like builders in the current framework. So the assumption is many of the folks like Block Native who operate Ethereum block builders will also operate 4337 bundlers. And once I figured that out, that was sort of the big unlock for me. I went, oh, oh, okay, it's everything going backwards from this point. You still have an EOA signing transactions. The nature of that is a little bit different. But what happens is it suddenly clarified everything. So I put together this diagram and a, a mental model, and I tweeted it out with a meme from a, from a movie. Oh, I'm blanking on the name of the movie, Ready Player One, where at the beginning of Ready Player One, I'm not really giving anything away. There's a challenge. It's a car race. And the main character figures out that the, the hack to the car race is instead of going forward at the beginning of the car race, he needs to go backwards. And that unlocks this sort of puzzle. And so I, I put that on there and that really seemed to take off. And, and now it's widely referenced as the way that you think about 4337 is it's this user intent layer where users use their 4337 wallets to express their intent on what they want to do. That gets picked up by a bundler. The bundler turns those intents into transactions that ultimately get on chain and, and implement them. And there's a whole incentive scheme that's part of all this to make that happen. And the response was great, overwhelming. And I think it was you know, another a missing piece of the puzzle that a lot of folks needed to sort of say, oh, now I got it. And, and it's really cool to see it referenced. I mean, Tarun Chitra referenced it in a recent talk he did about ZK Research. Team at Visa just published a really great paper about their experiments in 4337 and, and referenced that work as well. So it's also one of those things that I really enjoy is the ability to make you know, small but meaningful contribution to the ecosystem that helps move everything forward. Because again, you know, we're trying to build the foundation of the next economy, and that requires that you know, everyone be moving downfield together. So we benefit from this work from others and where we can, we like to contribute new ideas and new metaphors and new mental frameworks that helps everybody you know, move forward together. Love it. That's a terrific explanation, actually. That makes a ton of sense. So I'm curious, with Scaling Block Native, what were some of the unique opportunities there, unique challenges there that came with that territory? Oh, scaling is, is one of the most challenging things to do as, as an entrepreneur because it's this really interesting mix of what you're building, market feedback, economic you know, results, you know, how you're performing, team, team growth, team challenging, you know, how the, the space is evolving underneath you. We have really always tried to sort of stay 
as close to the cutting edge as we can. We, we think that's a pretty exciting and interesting place to be intellectually. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity for doing so. Of course, it's, it's easy to get out over your skis and, and get a little too far ahead and guess that something's going to happen that doesn't happen or, it, or it, it goes in a different direction. Or, you know, you see some positive results. You plot your line up and to the right. You say, hey, we're going to the moon. You start to hire and spend accordingly. And then the bottom falls out of the market and things get more challenging. So, you know, it's, it's the, the number one thing that all early stage startups face is how to scale properly. As far as I'm concerned, it's, it's more about people than anything else and, and having great people who are really passionate about the problems you're trying to solve and, and driving alignment across the team. So getting everybody to understand that, you know, what direction we're going in as an entity and, and how what they're doing fits into that. We have this event, we call it Block Native Palooza. We do it every six months. Our team is distributed globally. We have folks basically all over the world. But every six months, we bring everyone together to both reconnect in person, to reflect on what we've learned over the course of the past six months, and to align on strategy over the next six months. And it's amazing. We've done four of them now. And every time people come in saying, I have some questions on strategy, I'm feeling a little lost. And then we get together for a week or so, and then they leave saying, oh, I'm really clear on what we need to do and fired up, right? And what happens is over the course of the next six months, we build a bunch of stuff, we learn a bunch of things, the space evolves, new competition, certain things work, certain things don't. And that strategy that was so clear six months ago needs to be updated to reflect both our progress and our setbacks, as well as sort of the new stuff that's happened in the market. And so that's something we believe in quite a bit. It's it's an event that everybody looks forward to. We just wrapped up our most recent one a few weeks ago. And so when it comes to scaling, I think it's it's as much about team and alignment as anything else. We're Love also it, yeah. super lucky, I should say, to, to operate in as vibrant a space as Web3 and, and the Ethereum ecosystem. There's just so much opportunity out there. The hard part is finding the, the most interesting thoughts to be and then competing for them because there's a lot of other smart teams that are doing the same thing. Absolutely. And I want to zero in on something you said where you you mentioned you know some of the prediction nature of scaling an early stage project where you do have to kind of forecast or predict where things are going and staff appropriately, right? As you're building in that direction. One question that's become kind of a recurring question on this podcast is if I were to say the future of crypto is blank, how would you fill in that blank? You know, if you were to kind of make uh, some sort of assessment of the space right now, where is crypto going? I would use the term I used before, the future of crypto is expressive. At the end of the day, we, you know, the these Web3 systems are fundamentally about transactions, meaning if you're not doing transactions and why go through all the complexity of, of doing this stuff, just use a database, right? But where you need to do transactions, historically, transactions have been these very fixed, immutable, opaque, predetermined things. Some credit card network determines what a transaction is, what the rules are, and there's no ability to modify that. Or a stock trading system, or you know, your bank, right? Or pick your favorite, right? What happens with crypto and Web3 is the very transactions themselves become programmable, meaning they can take on all sorts of new characteristics, all sorts of new possibilities, all sorts of new operators, Boolean characteristics, fees, speed, things like that. And that opens up a universe of possibility for organizations that know how to harness that. And so what we see is that the macro sort of secular shift is these Web3 systems with Ethereum at the forefront of that are becoming ever more programmable and therefore ever more expressive. This enables entirely new classes of user experience, entirely new classes of of value transfer, of value creation that motivated developers are now actively exploring. And so we think this is the key here is a maximally expressive programmable system is a maximally valuable system. And that's why we're, you know, so deeply focused on the Ethereum ecosystem, because we think that's where the, 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 the best work and the most thorough work is really happening. And also, you know, we see every, every day how the limitations of the existing financial system and the nature of its transactions, you know, hold back communities, hold back societies, hold back various entities from self-determining. And and therefore, this system that we're building, this foundation that we're building, is fundamentally more equitable for the, the coming generation. And that will create new opportunities for, for you know, progress at both a, a local and a, and a national and global level. 
personally, you know, I connect the dots to some of the, the big challenges we face as a global society. And that crypto and Web3 being one of the, the really critical innovations that will enable us to um, not just navigate these challenges, but to, to overcome them and come out stronger. And so that's why we're super excited to be doing fundamental work in the space. Love it. Okay, so Matt, two last questions here, a little bit more zoomed out, a little more general. First question, what advice would you have for founders building in the kind of crypto, crypto and blockchain space, just agnostic to any particular vertical of it, but just kind of anyone that's going to be in this space? What are some things that from your experience they should know about? Well, if you're coming from the outside, I would just say spend some time to get used to the technology and the norms of the space. It's it's quite a bit different than anything else that's come before it. I've done internet companies, I've done mobile companies, I've done big, you know, work with big networking and, you know, I'm relatively quick to pick up new tech and new, new cultures. Crypto is by far the hardest and most difficult or sort of the steepest learning curve, if you will. And so anyone from the outside coming in, I would say, spend some time to acclimate to the realities of this world. Once you do so, I would really focus on trying to pursue white space, right? There's a lot that's being built. There's a lot of teams that are out there. And for the most part, you know, slugging it out with a few other providers to win in a narrow space, I think is going to be a less meaningful, less fruitful, less profitable endeavor than venture forth in a new area. What's amazing about Web3 is there's always new frontiers that are opening, whether it's a new chain, a new L2, a new you know core innovation like ERC4337. In the world of, of Ethereum, you have this constant march on the, the roadmap like EIP4844 and others. And so it's no mystery about what's coming. It's a little bit of a mystery about exactly when, but that means you can quite quickly get to a new frontier and explore white space that, that others aren't building in and, and make material contributions to the space. It's super fun for you. It's super fun for your team and you advance the state of the art. So those would be the two things that I'd give, you know, I'd, I'd provide advice for anyone. Like, don't build yet another, I don't know, wallet, right? Like there's just a lot of wallets out there. There's a lot of slugging it out. It's not to take anything away from those who are doing so, but does the world need the upteenth, you know, non-custodial wallet? Maybe, maybe not, unless you have something really new to add. But instead, if if you're going to build in the wallet space, like what can you do in the 4337 domain that's not being done anywhere else, right? How do you deliver that? That's really quite interesting. So my hope is that we continue to push the barriers on innovation. Love it. Matt, okay, last question here. What is your team working on right now? And what's the best way for people to follow along on your journey? So as you might imagine, we're very focused on all things block building and all things 4337. We publish quite regularly on our blog and on our Twitter, sort of what's top of mind for us. So you can find us at blocknative.com and all the tools that I mentioned before are easily accessible there. We're also at Block Native on all major social platforms, but particularly Twitter. My full name is Matt Cutler, but I'm usually M Cutler, M-C-U-T-L-E-R. You can find me on Twitter at M Cutler. We have a pretty vibrant Discord community as well. So if there's specific aspects of our portfolio you want to dive deeper in, you have questions, you have concerns, jump into our, our Discord community. And if you're an MEV searcher, we'd love to receive blocks from you. If you are a validator or staking pool, we'd love you to allow list our relay. And if you're a builder, whether you're building you know, infrastructure, if you're building dApps or protocols, we'd invite you to check out our APIs and tooling to incorporate because it's just going to accelerate everything that you're doing. We're increasingly asked to do more and more sophisticated things for more and more sophisticated enterprises and institutions. So if you're a larger organization that's looking to get into Web3, you need some expert advice and you need some expert infrastructure to accelerate that effort. We'd love to talk with you as well. So, oh, and then the final thing is we're out at a lot of the major events and conferences. And if you come across a Block Native team member, whether we're speaking or wandering the floor, have a booth, please do come up and introduce yourself. We always like to meet new faces and, and talk about what we're up to. So appreciate any interest that folks have and wish everyone all the best as they venture forth into Web3. Perfect. Matt, thank you so much for the time. Fascinating conversation. I know the listeners are going to love it. And thank you again for the time. Have a great upcoming weekend here. Thank you. You too. My pleasure. Bye-bye.